Jay. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Business Consultant. Jay Shear. Jay Shear Business Consulting. Hey, everybody. I'm Jay Shear with Jay Shear Business Consulting. We help entrepreneurs and business owners maximize their potential and build rock solid businesses and create more freedom in their lives. And you've joined Business Minds Coffee Chat. Singer songwriter Robert Palmer sang the lines You like to think that you're immune to the stuff. Oh, yeah. It's closer to the truth to say you can't get enough you know you're going to have to face it. You're addicted to love. Are we all addicted to something? What is your drug of choice? According to my next guest, if you haven't met your drug of choice yet, it's coming soon to a website near you. Well, on today's episode, we're going to explore the world of addiction, the neuroscience behind it, pain and pleasure, the effects of high dopamine stimuli, and how we can find balance in the age of indulgence. My guest is professor of psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine, chief of the Stanford Addiction Medicine Dual Diagnosis Clinic, a speaker, author of the best-selling book, Drug Dealer MD, and her latest book, the New York Times bestseller, Dopamine Nation. She's the recipient of numerous awards for research, teaching, and clinical innovation and treatment. She also appeared in the Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma. Please welcome Dr. Anna Lemke. Anna, it is great to see you. Thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Well, I am so excited about our conversation and researching you, consuming your content, reading Dopamine Nation. It has truly opened my eyes and it's been incredibly insightful and has really forced me to ask some much, some, some deep questions about myself and about others that I tend to spend time with. So I, I wanted to jump right into the conversation and I thought a good starting point for us would be for you to share with our audience what your favorite trait is about yourself. Oh, wow. Uh, I think my favorite trait about myself is that I'm willing to look into the dark places and be curious about them. Very good. That's an interesting one. So let's explore that. A little bit. We're going to certainly dig into Dopamine Nation, but when we think about the dark places and we are exploring those with a sense of curiosity, what does that mean to you? And can you give us an example of why that is a trait of yours and how that has been beneficial to you in your life? Yeah, great. Happy to talk about that. Um, you know, what I mean by that is that I I sort of make it a regular practice to spend time with my character flaws and try to understand them and how and when they're at play um, and what the consequences have been for me and others and what I can do about it. And uh, and a recent example is um, that I, um, uh, (laughs) it's amazingly difficult to talk about, Uh, which is what's, uh, you know, interesting about uh, these dark places. A lot of, uh, you know, shame comes up. And I think shame is a really important emotion to spend time with, as painful as it is. So, um, a couple of years ago, I started reading my teenage daughter's diary on occasion. And the entry into that was that she's a runner and she'd been injured and I didn't feel like she was forthcoming with me about that injury. Mm-hmm. And so I took to just occasionally uh, reading, you know, a couple entries, the most recent entries in her diary to um, try to get a sense of whether her leg was hurting her. And then um I continued that practice, which I knew to be wrong. 
um, and a violation of her privacy on and off for, I don't know, about a year and a half or so. Um, and it, it, it went then beyond my being concerned about her leg and it, it, it morphed into my just simply being curious about her inner world as she was differentiating um, her own selfhood and so hence not sharing as much of her inner world with me as she had done when she was a younger child. And really what it was, was I was kind of, of suffering from the loss of connection, which so many of us do as our children become adolescents and trying to recapture that. And um, I explored that wrong thing that I was doing. I talked about it with some other people, all of whom said, that is very wrong, Anna. You should not be doing that. And I knew it was wrong. Um, but the other thing that I realized was that in knowing things about her that she hadn't shared with me, none of them earth shattering. And it was really the most surprising thing was how little I featured in her diary. In fact, I wasn't mentioned ever, <laughs> which was funny for me because I thought, I think all the time about my kids and clearly, you know, part of adolescence is they're moving off in other directions. Anyway, um, I came to realize that it not only was um, a new, not a, not a, not helpful for my relationship with her, but it was actually harmful because then I knew things about her that she didn't know that I knew. And then our communication deteriorated because I didn't have to work on the communication because I was getting information in this other way. Uh, to make a long story short, I recently fessed up to her um, and apologized and she graciously forgave me. Um, uh, so that's an example, Jay. There you have it. <laughs> <laughs> that's a uh, that's a great example and thank you for sharing that even even though those are uncomfortable things to acknowledge I think to your point and this is really the primary point behind you sharing that and us having at least this this part of the of the conversation is that we we do need to explore those areas those those dark areas to try to better understand about our own psyche, about our own connection to pain and pleasure and why, what is the motivation behind that? And here you started to look at these diaries to try to, or your, your daughter's diary to try to understand whether she was in pain, whether her, her leg was bothering her, but it morphed into something different. And I'm curious, and, and I and I love the fact that you fessed up and that you had the conversation with her and that you apologized and, and that she accepted the apologize yeah. the the apology gracefully. What first when you discovered that in the writings there was no mention of you, how did that make you feel? Well, on the one hand, it was kind of a relief because, you know, the things that you imagine is all that your teenage daughter is saying all these horrible things about you in, 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 in her diary. But uh, my initial relief that kind of gave, 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 to what, gave way to like the realization like, oh, I'm not even really in her orbit. Like I'm not important in her life, which was, you know, I had then a sort of a complex combination of, of feelings on one hand. Um, wow, that's a bummer. Like I, I kind of don't rank, you know, but on another hand, it's like, okay, yeah, but that's good. You know, that's good because she's moving on and uh, she's gonna, she's her own person and she's much more preoccupied with her friends and her relationships with, uh, you know, the, the, her peers and that's all as it should be. So it was, a, it was at the end, a sort of a, a good realization. And also it was a kind of a wake up call to me that, oh, I'm, thinking about her far too much. She she is differentiating and moving away and that is good and healthy and I need to do the same. So, I mean, looking at these dark sides, I think one of the chief reasons to do it is because we recognize how we are hurting others. And I don't think any of us wants to be that person. Uh, so I think this is where conscience comes in. And there's a lot in our culture that sort of gets us away from that. Um, and kind of gives us a pass or tells us that's okay uh, to not think about, you know, the ways in which we're hurting others and to just look out for ourselves. So I think we have to, you know, have practices that allow us to really look hard at our own actions and how we might be inadvertently hurting other people, even under the guise of helping them, which is a, my common fault. Absolutely. Great, great point. I would 
really appreciate it if we could wind the clock back a bit. I'm I'm interested to find out how you when your interest in psychiatry first began. So really, what were the the seeds that started that began to germinate, and how did you ultimately decide to pursue a career in psychiatry? I think the the biggest factor was um, a close relative of mine, her own severe mental illness, including a severe manic psychotic episode with hospitalization, um, which initially made me afraid to become a psychiatrist and then ultimately became my, my primary motivation for wanting to become a psychiatrist, the kind of recognition of the brain as an organ and uh, a brain that can, an organ that can enter a disease state, a kind of humility um, I felt in the face of, you know, severe psychopathology, seeing my, uh, you know, my beloved relative in a very obvious uh, psychotic state where she had lost touch with reality and just being sort of impacted by that, that really made me want to, um, you know, go into psychiatry and help people with mental illness, treat mental illness. So those were, those were the main factors. And and you mentioned the word afraid, that you were afraid to go into psychiatry. What were you afraid of at that point, if you can uh, articulate yes. that? Just that it was all too close to home, that I would be overwhelmed by okay. patients because uh, they would remind me of this very difficult um, situation and time in, in my, my own family's life. Um, uh, but ultimately found that, that with the passage of time that, that actually informed the work and made it more mission driven. So eventually the, the fear gave way to something else. So what is something that you believed about yourself early on in life that you have since discovered wasn't true? Hmm. These are all such interesting questions. Okay. So um, I used to think that I wanted things to be very black and white. I wanted to know with a certainty uh, what was true and what wasn't true. And I wanted evidence and I wanted facts and I wanted to be able to compartmentalize things. And probably this is a partially a function of aging and realizing that nothing's black and white and nothing's a hundred percent, you know, evidence-based, but uh, my ability to tolerate nuance and even invite that as well as a, um, a kind of a, um, you know, an ability to accept um, and a desire really for ambiguity and uncertainty, being able to hold uncertainty. These are things that have um, changed a lot for me and, um, I'm very different in terms of those things now than I was in my younger self. If if you had held on to that belief about things or wanting things to be black and white, how would that have impacted your ability to be the type of psychiatrist that you are today? Or would you even be able to be the psychiatrist that you are today? Right. I don't think I would even be a psychiatrist because my first choice was to go into pathology. Um, and pathology is, you know, the study of cells. And one of the main reasons I chose that was because I didn't want ambiguity. I didn't want that wishy-washy stuff they were doing in psychiatry. I wanted to say this is a cancer cell or it isn't. Um, but what I discovered, uh, and this was pivotal for me, was that you could have five people five pathologists in a room, all of whom might disagree about whether a cell was a cancer cell or not. Um, and that was sort of like, oh, wow, there's not any hard, cold, uh, you know, uh, evidence or facts here either. Well, in that case, let me do something that I actually find interesting, which is uh, talking to people uh, rather than looking at cells under a microscope. So that that was the, the my transition. And then discovering um, that although I have a tendency to want to order things in my mind, I do like things to be ordered and um, logical and clear. I have a real desire for clarity. I am able to try to achieve that only to a certain point in the in the broader context of questions that are ultimately not answerable. Um, or let's say they're, they're not definitively answerable. They're answerable. But, uh, you know, uh, around the margins. Interesting. 
So I, I mentioned at the top of the podcast some of the accolades your which you're involved in today. There's so much that you have accomplished and continue to accomplish. I'm curious for all of those that are watching and listening right now who are in the entrepreneurial community, who are uh, business owners, who are looking to maximize their own potential. Can you share a bit about how you prioritize time, maybe a bit about if you have certain routines, things that you do to show up as your best self, to maintain a level of energy and accomplish as much as you're able to do? Mm. Well, um, I do regularly practice hormesis. Hormesis is the science of using pain to make us our, us more resilient, to make an organism, a living organism more resilient. Hormesis is Greek for to set in motion. And essentially there's a large and growing body of evidence showing that if you expose an organism to a mild, mild to moderate dose of a noxious stimulus like ice cold water or exercise or other uh, you know, intermittent fasting, other forms that of, of physical and mental pain that you actually um, can extend the life of the organism and also make that organism uh, more robust and more resi resilient in the face of those same exact stressors. So, um, and because I do believe that we're living in this dopamine overloaded world where we've essentially reset our hedonic or joy thresholds to the side of pain because we're constantly bombarding our reward pathways with these high dopamine substances and behaviors, I think we have to intentionally and with foresight seek out asceticism or painful um, practices in order to reset our reward pathways. So I usually start my day, you know, with some kind of um, um, physical activity, um, walking or swimming, Usually I get up very early around 5 a.m. Um, I don't touch any device until I've exercised and made my bed and eaten breakfast and brushed my teeth. And only then do I get on my digital device, whatever it may be. Um, I actually don't use a smartphone. I, I generally just use a laptop. Um, and then I try to be very intentional about what I do on my laptop because I appreciate that it's a drug and that digital media is drugified content and that I'm very vulnerable to get lost in it. So I try to be super intentional to notice when I'm scrolling for just the sake of scrolling and not really um, staying on task. And I try to consolidate uh, the time that I'm on my device and be very efficient with getting things done when I'm on the device. And then when I'm no longer doing things, I, um, I try to get off the device. I do allow myself like entertainment time, but it's usually premeditated and scheduled and limited in, in dose and duration, because I do know uh, from um, you know my research and my clinical experience and my own ex personal experience that dose and duration matter. The more we consume of any addictive substance, the more likely we are to get addicted to it. The more frequently we consume that substance, especially if we start consuming daily, uh, the more likely we are to get addicted. So trying to really um, limit my intoxicants to intermittent, moderate use. And then I just really, especially in this day and age of Zoom, like if I'm going to commit to go to a meeting, I try to be present at that meeting. I try not to do other things. Um, I think that we can experience, first of all, when we're not showing up, uh, you know, for other people, we're, we're really not showing up. I mean, we might as well have used that time in a different way. Um, so if you're going to go, that's what I tell myself, if you're going to go, you might as well really be there um, and not thinking about something else and doing something else, which is hard. Um, same thing when I see patients, I try really, really hard uh, not to be doing other things like checking my email or even checking you know, their medical chart unless I tell them I'm going to check their medical chart because I think they can see as soon as I've disappeared mentally. People are so sensitive to that you know, for good reason. Um, but also it's a moral injury to myself, right? Because I'm not holding up or acting in a way that's consistent with my own values and in a way that I want other people to show up for me. So let me, let me ask you a, a question, if I can explore just a moment, the, the digital device usage and conserving 
time. Do you time block in terms of digital device usage? So as you're looking at your day, do you actually, do you set up specific times, maybe 30 minutes, 45 minutes from this time to this time? How regimented are you? I, I use, uh, so I call these self-binding strategies. I talk about self-binding and dopamine nation, and this is a way to use time as a self-binding strategy. And I use it um, along these lines. I have hours in the day, roughly a certain set of hours in the day when I will be working. And for many of us, working means on a device of some sort. And I try to really limit my device usage to those hours and to not be on my device um, outside of those hours. So it might vary in terms of when I start, but I try to keep like a consistent block of time during which I'm working and consolidate that together and then put it away. And this is really the hard part because it's the kind of seepage into the rest of our time that we're all so vulnerable to. But I, I really try to um, literally like power it, stuff down, put it away. So then I have a block of time in which um, I'm not. Uh, you can liken this to a, a very popular trend now with food, which is intermittent fasting. So it's not so much what I'm eating, it's when I'm eating. And this idea that really I don't want to be eating past a certain time in the evening for all kinds of health reasons. I think we need to look at our digital consumption similarly and say, okay, past this time, I'm not going to be on a device. And that's painful and hard because I'm going to be jonesing to check my email or whatever it is. Um, but to really just leave it be uh, for long enough for me to stop thinking about checking it, you know. I mean, that, that's a habit, right, that we can change or a mental practice. And then to go through the whole night and wake up the next day and I'm not, it's not the first thing that comes to mind. In fact, there's a little bit of dread about getting on my device again, because now I've enjoyed the the distinct break um, from from that. But then I do because it's my work, right? Or I might plan in, you know, again, uh, last night I was watching NCAA uh, women's collegiate cross country. And my son had been in college, came home and, and I was watching, and I was absolutely glued to it. And he said, are you going to watch this whole video? And I said, yes, I am. And he said, it's 20 minutes long. I said, yes. And it's the only 20 minutes I have all day looked at a video. And could you stop talking so I can enjoy my 20 minutes? <laughs> but for him, you know, he'd been watching videos on his phone intermittently all day long. So he couldn't have imagined sitting through 20 minutes. But for me, well, that was really exciting, right? Because I hadn't been exposing myself to the potent drug that is a moving video. I mean, that's incredibly potent. So um, it was sort of like, yes, I'm enjoying my drug now. I've got 20 minutes. <laughs> Leave me alone. We'll talk afterward. So was it difficult at all to turn it off after 20 minutes or do you oh, still yeah, very feel hard. that? Oh, okay. yeah. Oh, I can find 20 more similar videos. Absolutely. Okay. You just, you you know, you have to kind of, it's a, that's where the discipline and the, I think the key is to be intentional before you're there. So a uh, very famous quote, uh, I think it was Dante or somebody in the throes of desire, there's no deciding. And that's really mm -hmm. true. We can't wait until we're in our drug uh, before we decide, do I want to keep doing this? Because of course we'll want to. We have to, before we engage, okay, I'm going to use this much and then I'm going to stop. And these are the reminders I'm going to put, put in place to help me stop um, so that I can really adhere to that. Absolutely. Well, we're going to talk more about some of the tools and strategies here in just a few minutes. I, I wanted to to jump into the social dilemma for just a moment, because sure. the the quote that comes up in the social dilemma that comes up more than one time is, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. And I, I wanted to find out from your perspective, what does that mean to you? And how has social media drugified human interaction? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what it means is that when we are engaging in any activity that is releasing a lot of dopamine in our reward pathway, and dopamine is our pleasure and reward neurotransmitter, 
we can get to a point where we actually lose autonomy. So we lose volitional control. We may believe that we are still the one who is deciding, uh, but in fact, we can get to a point where where we're no longer able to exercise our decision-making capacity because we're caught in the vortex of this reinforcing substance or behavior. So that I think that's what 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 is meant by you know you're, you 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 aren't using the product you you are the product. Uh, you lose that volitional control to decide for yourself how when how much how often you are going to consume. Um, and these products, uh, you know, we can use social media as the example are engineered to be addictive. This is uh, we have hacked this part of the brain. We know exactly how to do it. Um, it's achieved on social media because we have evolved over millions of years of evolution to connect with other humans. Connecting with other humans allows us to find mates, to steward scarce resources, to uh, protect ourselves against predators. Uh, we have needed to gather together in tribes as a matter of survival. And our brains get us to do that by releasing dopamine in the reward pathway when we connect with other humans. And the deeper the connection or the, the more positive the connection, the more dopamine that's released and the more dopamine that's released and the more quickly it's released, the more likely that substance or behavior is to be addictive. It has been true since the beginning of time that we can get addicted to sex and to people. Sex and love addiction has been around for a while. The internet and social media didn't invent it. However, the internet and social media did turn it into a much, much more potent version uh, of itself. Uh, because what you have on social media is in the absence of having to do any work to go out and meet the people, you can now from your couch, from your digital device, be exposed to an entire universe of attractive, beautiful, sexual, reinforcing uh, faces and personas. And if at any point there's any kind of frustration where you don't uh, are no longer getting a big dopamine hit or from that interaction, you can swipe right or swipe left or swipe up or swipe down and find something new, find something that's similar, uh, but a little bit different. And of course, this engages our treasure seeking function, which again is adaptive in a world of scarcity and ever present danger, highly mal maladaptive for the universe of uh, social media and digital media more broadly. So what, what, when you think about what makes something, uh, you know, more addictive and what characterizes the addictive nature of our dopamine overloaded world, it's four properties. It's quantity, access, potency, and novelty. Social media is virtually infinite, right? There's no end to the number of TikTok videos that people are going to put out there. Um, access, you know, the smartphone acts like the hypodermic syringe, it delivers digital dopamine 24 seven from wherever we are. As my uh, husband and I like to joke, yes, it's while running for the bus, you can now, you know, be looking for pornography. Um, novelty. So how do we come, uh, how do we overcome tolerance, which is inevitable, meaning that we need more of our drug over time and more potent forms to get the same effect. And one of the ways to overcome tolerance is uh, more potent versions of our drug and novel versions of our drug. And of course, the internet can do that in a nanosecond, right? More potent versions often occur by combining drugs together. So for example, people who get addicted to opioids soon discover if they combine opioids with benzos, they can augment the high, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the same thing is true on social media. If you now take um, you know, a beautiful face and combine it with uh, confetti and great music and a narrative storyline and a filter to make that person more beautiful. And then you enumerate it with rankings and likes and bottomless bowls and connections to more people. You've taken something that was like uh, the equivalent of, you know, um, 1970s uh, cannabis joint to, uh, you know, a modern day dabbing where you've got 90% THC content uh, in in the resin from the cannabis plant. And that kind of evolution we are seeing in ev with every drug that was ever invented, including drugs that didn't exist before, like digital content, uh, whether it's video games, pornography, social media, um, chess. You know, online chess is a great example. Here's a game that typically you had to go find somebody. It's a, you know, mentally challenging. Uh, you're more likely to lose than not unless you're exceptional. It takes a long time. 
Um, now you can go online. You can play these short versions of games. You don't even have to play. You can watch other people play. You can comment, right? Um, and I have people who are addicted to online chess. So define for us what addiction means, what it is, and if we were to tie that to the conversation that we're having right now with social media as an example, how do I know if I'm addicted to something that I'm doing on social media, whatever that happens to be? Yeah. So addiction broadly defined is the continued compulsive use of a substance or a behavior despite harm to self and or others. That can be harm that you recognize or harm that you don't recognize, but that other people recognize. The things to look for are the four C's out of control use, compulsive use, craving, and continued use despite consequences. Mm -hmm. That last one is probably the sine qua non or the real heart of addiction where we continue to use a substance or behavior despite harming ourselves and or harming others. When we're thinking about social media, so um, I would never suggest that there's nothing good about social media. This You and I are engaged here in a, in a form of social media. It's wonderful that we can use this technology to make human connections all over the world. It's absolutely fabulous. But when we begin to use social media, not to make human connections, but to chase a feeling, which is effectively the same thing as chasing a dopamine spike, spike, then I think we have to uh, begin to question our motives and our behavior and to wonder if we're now uh, getting sucked into the vortex of compulsive overconsumption slash, slash addiction. Some of so, the... Saw, mm -hmm, sir, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to ask, so as an example, if if I post something on, on social media, it could be related to, to business, uh, something that uh, that's on my mind... And I am constantly looking to see, did anyone engaged, engage with that post? Are they commenting on it? Are they liking it? Are they sharing it? How many times has it been viewed? Those sorts of things. If I'm drawn in to that information, it is that e each time I'm looking and each time that I am trying to find out if someone shared it, liked it, commented, that's giving me a dopamine hit. Yes, it is. Yes. So if I'm obsessed with looking for that information, looking at that information, that is a, and it's keeping me away from my family or building relationships or taking care of my own health, that is a form of addiction. Yeah, I would say that that has now progressed to a bona fide addiction, but I think we need to look even earlier than when it becomes consequential and begin to be aware of the ways large and small. We are all getting sucked into this vortex of compulsive overconsumption before it gets to the level of addiction. So for example, in my case, when Dopamine Nation first came out, I thought that maybe five people would read it. It was an unexpected bestseller. And uh, I found myself over about a one week period um, compulsively checking Amazon probably every hour at one point to see where it was in the rankings because it got, you know, got to be like in the top five and oh my goodness, that, you know, huge dopamine hit. And then I began to observe myself um, you know, checking it, right. Wanting to see how, oh, where is it now? And, you know, and then an interesting thing happened where um, I began to observe in myself that whereas previously, like anywhere in the top 100 would have been great, now the top five wasn't good enough, right? So that interesting escalator, no matter how high we go, it's never enough. Then you know you are getting into this addiction cycle. And then my reaction uh, after you know realizing what was happening and how it was actually making me unhappy and that's really key, like the soft signs of discontentedness that these kinds of behaviors engender. I, I said, I can't, I can't check this anymore. Now I don't check it. Occasionally other people, you know, my agent or my daughter, oh, mom, you know, did you know? I was like, oh, that's great. But I know I can't check it because it, it leaves a residual, which puts me in a bad place. So speaking of dopamine nation, <laughs> what was the the true catalyst for writing the book? Why, why did you feel that 
now was the appropriate time to do so. And then also as you're sharing that with us, I would love it if you would maybe share how the process of writing this book changed you as a human mm. being. What did you learn about yourself as you were bringing this book to life? Wow, great. Okay. Well, the catalyst it wasn't really, these are ideas and I've been practicing psychiatry for 25 years. And these are, these are trends that I've been seeing over the course of my career, more and more people who have all of the privilege and gifts that we could hope for in life, you know, uh, interesting jobs, privileged schools, good families, their, their physical health, uh, who are just desperately unhappy. Um, and the ways in which both we as mental health providers, but also as parents, as teachers, as friends, um, respond to unhappiness with trying to make people even more comfortable. And my recognizing that that this is actually backfiring terribly and that what we really need in life is more friction, um, more intentional um, uh, hardship, um, more eschewing, avoiding, and moderating, uh, highly reinforcing feel-good drugs and behaviors. And I learned that 100% from my patients in, in recovery, because at the same time that I was having people come in who were depressed and anxious and you know wanted a pill, I was having these amazing people get into recovery from you know, drugs and alcohol who were discovering a way of living in the world, which was clearly uh, very positive um, and very um, healthy and, and transformational really for themselves and their loved ones. And the secret ingredients which I of those lives, which I talk about in the book, because I do consider people in recovery from addiction as modern day prophets for all of us, or things like abstinence, uh, moderation, uh, radical truth telling, um, pro social shame, intentionally doing things that are hard, um, living according to your values, things like that. So, um, so those ideas were s sort of all kind of culminating. But then I met um, a patient, and when I met this patient, I said to myself, "This is this is the this is the vehicle." For telling this story, and that was my patient with a very severe sex addiction. A you know, a Stanford scientist, a lovely man, very gifted, brilliant, wonderful person, a nice person, uh, who had developed a very serious sex addiction, betrayed his wife, betrayed his own values, ultimately built a masturbation machine. Um, and what resonated for me was the way that his masturbation machine, which sounds so, oh gosh, I don't even. I mean, almost repulsive maybe is the word to put on it, but I was, I saw the parallels between his masturbation machine and my own digital devices and the ways in which our smartphones really are masturbation machines, how we're meeting our needs with, instead of doing the hard thing of connecting with other human beings in real life. And I had developed prior, much prior to seeing this patient, I had developed uh, a, a romance novel reading addiction and the parallels between this patient and my own, um, you know, eventual, you know, minor addiction to romance. It didn't, it didn't break anything in my life, but it, it certainly wasn't healthy. Um, I was just struck by it um, and struck by the ways in which we're all becoming addicted and, uh, and the ways in which, you know, this wisdom of recovery um, is something that everybody can benefit from. And so that, that then, that was the crystallization of how to communicate these ideas to, you know, a broader readership. Well, you, you do such a, uh, such a remarkable job of sharing the stories of your clients. And uh, obviously for all of those that are watching and listening right now, the names have been changed, but you do go into some depth and detail. And that first story that you opened the book up with as an example is it is a true eye opener it's an uncomfortable story to read and i you know i i i wonder from your perspective as you're sitting across from this individual or really many of them that are in this book and others that are not in this book is there anything at this 
point in life and in your work after doing this for 25 years, is there anything that would surprise you to hear now? Mm, great. Yeah. So yes, and always. And that's why this is such an amazing career because mm. you, you think you've seen it all. And then in, you know, through that door walks something, you know, someone who tells a story, you're like, oh, wow, I've never heard quite that, that before. Also, let me just add that my patients who are detailed in great depth in the book are my co-authors to some extent. I ask them, all of them permission. Um, everything about their stories is true, except for the names being changed. And they all agreed to, um, in fact, enthusiastically agreed, you know, to share their stories as a way to help others. So I wanted to Beautiful. just make, make sure that, uh, you know, that folks know that. It, it's truly a beautiful gift. It, it is. And Thank you. I, you know, the, the, the book, and this is for those who perhaps haven't read it yet or aren't familiar with it, we're certainly going to provide links in the show notes here so you can pick up a copy for yourself. But the book really explores some exciting discoveries that you are able to outline and they explain why the the pursuit that we have for pleasure actually leads to pain and not only explains that to us but then also and you've shared some of this sprinkled through the conversation shares some of these strategies that can be employed some things that that we can do and i always believe that in situations like this that the awareness piece is so critical like when someone comes to you as an example in your practice there is some sense of self-awareness that something is wrong right right something is wrong and it's, and it's causing a, a, a problem in my life maybe with my family my career things along those lines so paying attention to what is happening around us and paying attention to sometimes very subtle changes, I think is part of the, the battle. It's part of the process. And then what do we do with that self-awareness is really what matters most, right? Being able to reach out for help, uh, just being honest and candid. And when I read some of these stories, like the very first story is an example in the book, it's very raw. It's incredibly raw. And as you explain what this particular patient was, was doing, the extent that this patient went to, to, to be able to satisfy this, this addiction is really, it, it's, it's amazing. It truly is. I, I mean, sometimes I, I, I can just imagine you sitting there and thinking that the, you know, just when you thought maybe you had seen it right. all and heard it all, <laughs> right. that uh, that the the human mind can mm -hmm. actually take us in some very interesting places. And I think to your point at the beginning of our conversation, talking about the curiosity and exploring some of those dark places, this was definitely exploring some dark places to feed something that was insatiable. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, think about the amount of mutual trust it takes, right, to be able to open up about some of those very dark things that that we've all done uh, in our lives. You know, I don't think anybody is immune from that. Um, I mean, the enormous amount of trust, you know, to be able to tell another human being. And then when that other human being responds, not by you know, screaming and running from the room, but instead saying, you know, well, tell me, tell me more about that. Uh, boy, the, the de-shaming that happens and the kind of like uh, gratitude that we all feel, I think when we realize, okay, this, I'm not going to be, uh, you know, sum summarily rejected for this thing, that there's a space in between this behavior and my shame where um, I can I can look at this and I can explore this and this other person's even willing to look at and explore it with me. I mean, that's very, very liberating and very important. Absolutely. So for 
our audience members who may be dealing with some issues surrounding addiction, whether it's uh, prescription drugs, uh, illegal drugs, sex addiction, you, you name it, whatever the addiction happens to be, what is the very first thing that you would suggest and recommend to them if they have not already taken a first step? Let's talk about where help can be found. Hmm. And obviously reading this book is is a great step in the right direction, but share with us from your clinical perspective, what should we be doing first? What are the priorities we should be focused on? Well, I mean, I think the first priority is safety, right? So if the behavior is imminently um, risky for us or other people, um, we have to really look at that and try to uh, do what we can to make it more safe, make our, our consumption more safe. And if we find that, you know, we can't even do that, then we need to turn to another human being, somebody, um, you know, in our lives or somebody, an addiction medicine doctor or uh, somebody in a 12 step group, like Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous, Sexaholics Anonymous, uh, turn to somebody and say, hey, you know, I, I need help. Um, connecting with another human being, that's really one of the major um, antidotes to addiction. It's, it's an isolating disease. Um, it comes from isolation, but it also begets isolation. So we need to, uh, you know, uh, the, again, it's like a uh, anti-venom. We need to connect with other people. Um, and then, you know, ultimately we need to find a way to abstain from our drug for long enough in order to reset those reward pathways. And that can be done under medical supervision. It can be done in, in peer recovery, um, like a 12 step setting, it can be done with a close friend or family member, but we really need to get our frontal lobes back online. And we can't do that when we're actively in our addiction. It's very difficult to see true cause and effect and also to, you know, um, to escape the constant cravings. Uh, we can get there, but uh, when we're on one side of the Grand Canyon, it, it feels like jumping on the other side of the Grand Canyon. So we typically need help. So true. And so for all of you, that are watching and listening right now, please, please take these words to heart and ask for help. There is no shame in asking. And that is one of the best things that we can do is to ask to start that process. There are plenty of resources available. So I'm, I'm curious, Anna, what are one to two of the big questions that you're asking yourself today? Um, well, I'm asking a lot of questions about how we parent in a dopamine overloaded world. I do touch on that in Dopamine Nation a little bit, but I'm exploring that more. And I'm very interested also in um, how to combat narcissism, which I think is really uh, the problem of society more than it is of individual people. And so thinking how, how can we create a society that's less narcissistogenic uh, for lack of a, a, a better word. So let me bolt on to that second one for a moment. Where does that, who, who owns that problem? H how do we, and that's a bigger question, but what's a starting point for us? Who do we need to to get on board to be able to solve that problem? It's because it's a societal issue as well. I think so. I mean, I think it's important, and I, and actually that that in its, that perspective in and of itself is a little radical, right? Because it is listed in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual as a mental disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, which means we place it in the brain of certain individuals who we deem to have that disorder. But I think that's a mistake. Um, I think it's not really in necessarily in coming from individual brains that have been wired, you know, in, in some kind of uh, dysfunctional way. I think it's in society and it's in our communities, and then certain vulnerable individuals will manifest. Um, more more than others, 
But uh, I think this is a really a communal communal problem. It's a problem of uh, really, ex it's an existential problem. Like, well, wh why are we here? What is our purpose? Um, you know, and when when our purpose it be becomes conflated with seeking material wealth or seeking power or seeking fame, which our society is preoccupied with, then naturally, um, you know, we are going to reward narcissistic behaviors, which are really make people very, very unhappy, not just the person who's manifesting those behaviors, but everybody around them. So I think, how do we combat that? Well, I will be listening and watching to find out what you, the, the, as you explore that in more detail, what you write about and some of your insights and ideas there. So I appreciate yeah, well, you sharing you. that. Yeah. So here is my final question to you as we wrap up. What is the most difficult decision that you've had to make in the pursuit of who you've become? Um, well, I mean, I, I think that, um, I mean, along the lines of my own narcissistic tendencies, um, you know, what I've had to do is learn to really, um, give it over to a higher power and, uh, to people who I consider to be wiser than I, and again, to just recognize how limited and how broken I am. I'm not alone in that. I think that's a, the state of humans, but uh, to really, really confront that. Um, and that was a very difficult thing for me to do, but it, it, I was at a point in my life where there also was no other option. Um, and that was many years ago now. So, and I, I'm so much better off for it. I'm so grateful for that difficult moment. Beautiful response. And I connect with that one. I'm still learning that yeah, me myself. Too. It's a work in progress. <laughs> yes, it is. Well, Anna, I want to thank you so very much oh, for joining us today. Welcome. This has been such a great conversation and I, I appreciate you and I'm grateful for all that you've done and what you've given our audience today. Oh, thank you. That's so nice. My pleasure. It's been a joy to talk to you. Thank you. And for all of you, thank you so very much for watching and listening. Would you please take a moment to subscribe, rate, leave us a review, if you will. That goes a long way. And to enjoy more episodes, all you need to do is visit jshearbusinessconsulting.com slash podcast. And until next time, keep learning and growing. Make sure you pick up a copy of Dopamine Nation, and we'll see you on the next Business Minds Coffee Chat. Take care, everybody. Jay. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Business Consultant. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Business Consulting.